honor and a privilege to speak to 600 Oregon small farmers and supporters of small farming about how we can shape uh, the direction of change in agriculture and how we can create a better future out here in rural America. I'm in my 34th year at the Center for Rural Affairs. Uh, the center has been around for about 40 years, just short of 40 years, uh, fighting for family farming, fighting for uh, small business, fighting to build a better future in, in rural America, and doing so in ways that, that protect the environment and are sustainable. The Center for Rural Affairs is part of rural America, and it's part of us. We've always been based in a town of under 1,000 people, and it's not a suburb of anywhere. And uh, you know what that means is that when we work on rural issues, it, it's about our lives, it's about our families' lives, it's about our neighbors' lives. And when we have coffee after church or we have a beer after work, we're talking with other people whose lives are affected by the work we do. And I think that makes us a more authentic voice and a more honest voice, maybe a more accurate voice for rural America. We set out to, to, to work to create a future in rural America that, that's based on the values that reflect the best in rural people. A future based on fairness that ensures that everybody who contributes to this nation's prosperity shares in it. A future based on widespread ownership where the people who work the farms and the businesses have the opportunity to own the fruits of their labor. A future based on responsibility because every one of us has a responsibility to conduct our private affairs with integrity, but also, but also to give something back, to give something back to our community and take responsi shared responsibility for the future of our community, our state, our nation, our world. And finally, a, a future based on stewardship, because I believe, and the Center for Rural Affairs, we believe that every one of us has a moral responsibility to leave the land to the next generation, at least as well as we received it. Because I think one of the things that made family farm communities unique in this nation, and made them distinct, frankly, from agriculture in the southern U.S. or from the, the great industrial centers in, um, in the industrial belt, was to a much greater extent in these family farm communities than we saw elsewhere. The people who worked enjoyed the benefits of ownership and they shouldered the responsibilities of ownership. And that brought meaning to life and work for generations of rural people and it created much healthier communities. Now there's a large body of research on how the way we farm affects life in the rural community. And some years ago, a, a sociologist at the University of California summarized the studies, and I'll never forget one, one sentence in his study. Um, actually, it's two sentences. He said, every serious study reaches the same conclusion, in that communities that are surrounded by farms that are larger than can be operated by a family have a few wealthy elites, a majority of poor laborers, and virtually no middle class. Now that, my friends, is not progress. That is social decay. The next wave of change in agriculture and rural communities, I believe, can be shaped by the entrepreneurship of rural people. And I believe it can be driven, this, this is not automatic, but I think it can be driven by a growing search for something better among the American people that we increasingly see today um, a growing yearning for authenticity and genuineness, a desire to be associated with that, a search for community and a meaningful relationship uh, with both people and the land, a search for meaning and significance in life, um, and an emerging tendency to value the quality of experience over the quantity of things. But at the end of the day, it's up to us. It's up to us to take responsibility to de for determining our own destiny and for shaping our own future. I want to talk about four strategies today by which um, we, together, uh, can shape the next wave of change in agriculture in rural America. Four strategies by which we can take control of our own destiny. We must protect the authenticity of small farming and use that authenticity to its full potential to enable small farms to fight for big markets. You know, when small farmers first started selling organic, uh, local foods, natural foods, what have you, it was all authentic. But as that market grew, 
and there was more and more money to be made, of course, corporate America stepped in. And that led to, of course, the emergence of corporate organic and corporate natural. And they took a lot of that market away. And I think the best asset that small farmers have in winning a chunk of that market back is their own authenticity by responding fully and faithfully to what consumers want and trust. And I have to tell you that every poll I've ever seen of consumers says that consumers in America trust small farmers more than they trust big agriculture to provide safe and good food in a responsible manner. And I'm starting to see in corporate America now a recognition of that. You see it, for example, in the statement by the CEO of Whole Foods recently, who said that small farmers are today's rock stars and heroes. And you're even seeing it now at Walmart, of all places, where Walmart is beginning to feature small farm um, uh, and local produce. Now, a lot of us are skeptical about some of those, of the genuineness of that interest. But I have to tell you that one way to test it is to offer it to, to them and, and organize ourselves to offer it to them. And if we want to be successful at that, I think there are two things we have to do. One is we have to have some sort of a label or a standard for what it means for food to come from a small family farm. And it has to be authentic. And then we need to be able to offer people small farm local or small farm organic, or small farm natural. And, I, and in this, I cannot stress enough the importance of authenticity. It's got to be real. I've been in discussions where people say, well, you know, a family farm is one where the, the family that owns it provides management. Well, hell, Tyson Foods would qualify under that management, or under that standard. Um, I think an authentic standard is one that says the family that owns the production provides the majority of the labor and the management now, maybe it's in produce and vegetables. Maybe there's some allowance for seasonal, um, seasonal labor. But I think it's got to be real. It's got to be a standard that leaves somebody out, or else it's not authentic, and else, or else it doesn't mean anything. And the other thing I think we need to do is we, as small farmers, need to band together more effectively. They need to band together more effectively so that they can say, um, to, whether it's Whole Foods or Walmart or whomever, that we can get you the volume of production you need when you need it, and production that allows you to gain an edge in the market by telling consumers this comes from a, a certified small farm. But we'll get it to you, but you've got to be willing to negotiate with us. And you've got to be willing to pay us a price that shares with us the additional value you get by being able to, to say that this is small farm organic or small farm local or small farm natural. And if we do those things, if we do those things, I'm convinced um, that small farmers can take back a bigger chunk of the market that's already been lost to corporate, to corporate agriculture. And if we get ourselves organized to capture that market, that's a big deal. Oregon country beef, now I think it's country natural beef, but it's one of the real examples that I cite, not just in Oregon, but I cite in Nebraska and all over this country. Start out as I think 40 or 50 ranch families, family ranches, um, who got together and started selling their beef together um, and uh, a lean and natural beef produced on family ranches in ways people support. And when they sold it, they were able to charge the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And they got that when cattle prices were high and when cattle prices were low. And they could do that because they had a product that was unique, that was worth more to consumers, and they had banded together and negotiated for a fair price. And I think we can do that across agriculture, and by doing it, we can recapture a lot of the market for small farms. We need to be entrepreneurial beyond the farm as well as on the farm to pursue the full range of opportunities to create our own jobs in rural America. You know, the, the backbone of the rural American economy, beyond, in addition to family farming, has always been microenterprise. It's those businesses that are started by someone to provide themselves a job and maybe, you know, five or ten other jobs. You know, where I come from on the, the rural Great Plains, of the nation, that's where most of the new jobs come from. Microenterprise is critical to all of America in times like this, in times of recession, because I can tell you that in our last recession, from 2000 to 2003, microenterprise employment grew by 9%, while bigger, while bigger businesses were casting off jobs. And microenterprise led America out of recession the last time, and it can do it again if we start to support microenterprise and invest in, in develop, developing it and help people pursue their entrepreneurial dreams. 
And I have to believe that the, the opportunities um, for microenterprise are growing, not shrinking, because, in part because of the Internet. You know, it used to be that a small business in a rural community just had a local market. But today, a small business in a rural community has the world as its market. And that's true for goods, like I mentioned, culinary oils and pickled asparagus. But it's also true for business services, things like um, you know, software programming or what have you. Um, there's a lot of opportunities now for folks who grew up in rural communities, went to college, went off to the city and got a job in corporate America, and now want to come back to, to leave their job in, in urban America, come back and set up as a small business providing the same service to businesses they used to provide as an employee, but doing it over the Internet as an independent business. Um, there's a lot of opportunity out there, and we need to pursue those opportunities. But one of the things we have to do is get our public policy right to support that kind of business. Small farmers need to be part of the solution to climate change. Climate change is the environmental issue of our generation. Climate change is going to be rough on people if we don't get a, hold of, get a handle on it. In the developing world, um, you can expect millions of people to die because of loss of ability to produce food, a loss of farmland to rising oceans. Here in America, you can expect uh, a lot more extreme weather events, shifting weather patterns. So some places that were fit for farming at one point no longer are fit for that type of agriculture. You can expect a lot more super heavy rains, a lot more dry spells, um, just more extremes. And that is the bane of agriculture. You can expect a lot of problems. You can expect uh, higher tax burdens to pay for the challenges that our coastal areas are going to face as uh, the oceans rise. We've got to address this. We can't just let this go and put our heads in the sand. And the good news is, I think, is that there are great opportunities for small farmers to be part of the solution to the problem of climate change and to gain some benefit for doing that. One of the best ways to reduce greenhouse gases is simply to build soil organic matter. Uh, the number one Greenhouse gas that's causing warming is carbon dioxide. The very, probably one of the top two places to put carbon dioxide, one's in the ocean and one is in the soil in the form of organic matter. And while recent events in Washington have kind of put on hold the whole debate of paying people to take carbon out of the atmosphere, I have to believe it's ultimately going to return and happen. And when they do, I think we need to fix the way that was done so it works for small farms. Um, because when it was first done, it really didn't embrace the practices that most small farmers use, things like cover crops and crop rotation and all those things that build soil really weren't recognized in the original protocols that paid farmers to build soil carbon. They were more focused on practices used on bigger farms like methane digesters on very large livestock operations and no-till. And, and no-till is not bad. It can make some contributions in some places to, to building soil carbon, but it's not the only way to build soil carbon. I also believe that America critically needs the participation of small farmers of conscience in the debate over climate change. You know, in Washington, the greatest resistance to addressing this most critical environmental issue this nation's ever faced, the greatest resistance is coming to representatives of rural areas, frankly. And, I, and I, so I just think it's critical that small farmers of conscience demonstrate that we're not just living for today, and that many rural Americans are prepared to sacrifice for the good of the country and to sacrifice for the good of the future gen of our next generations, just like rural Americans step up to the plate when it comes time for military service. And I think in this regard, maybe the most important thing is that we need to be in respectful conversation with our neighbors about climate change. We don't know with 100% certainty that human actions, burning fossil fuels, is causing climate change. The leading climate scientists say we're 90% certain that burning fossil fuels is causing climate change, but not 100%. And we won't know with 100% certainty until it's too late to do anything about it. And that says to, to me that the conservative approach and the responsible approach is to take action now Small farmers of conscience need to be having that kind of a conversation in their community. They need to be having that kind of a conversation with their members of Congress. We need to reverse the bias in public policy in this country towards subsidizing the big and the powerful and against investing and creating a future in rural America. 
You know, in 2007, the Center for Rural Affairs did an analysis of how USDA spends its money. And we looked at 13 leading farm states, and we looked at how much USD, USDA was spending just on subsidizing the 20, just the 20 biggest farms in each of those 13 leading farm states. And then we compared, to the, compared that to how much USDA was spending on rural development programs to create genuine opportunity for rural folks in the 20 counties in those same states that were struggling most with population loss. And here's what we found. We found that USDA had spent twice as much to subsidize the 20 biggest farms in each of those states as it had spent to create genuine opportunity for over 3 million people in thousands of small towns in the 20 most struggling counties in those 13 states. Now that, my friends, is just wrong. That is just wrong. And it is particularly critical that we address it in this Congress. Because in this Congress, there's going to be action on budget and cutting budgets. And probably, there's also going to be a farm bill. And that makes this a particularly critical time to make decisions about what's a priority and what's most important and what does the most for us, and also to identify those areas where we're spending money in ways that maybe aren't doing much good or maybe doing harm. Like when we subsidize the biggest farms to go out and bid land away from their neighbors and drive smaller operations out of business. I'd say that's not a very good use of public dollars. And I'd also say that when we throw away money on such perverse purposes as subsidizing mega farms to drive smaller operations out of business, we don't have anything left to invest in creating a future in rural America or a future in small farms. A farm bill has to do with the broadest range of, well, it has to do with everything in USDA. It includes rural development programs. It includes agricultural research. It includes beginning farmer programs. It includes small business development programs for rural communities. It includes food programs. A farm bill is really a farm, food, rural community bill that also deals with research. And the, stark, the choice in this farm bill is either going to be that we finally come to grips with how we run farm programs in this country, and we put some real caps on payments to the biggest farms, and probably make some across-the-board cuts on the direct payments that are made even when prices are high. Um, and we have a lot of, we're making those payments now when prices are at record levels uh, for corn and soybeans in my part of the country. And I, let me tell you what, it's not improving the income of farm operators. It's it's what it's doing, is driving up cash rents. Um, so we either cap the payments to the biggest farms and make some modest across-the-board cuts in those direct payments, or we make deep cuts in the very things that invest in our future. You know, there's a big target right now on the Conservation Stewardship Program. It's the program in the last Farm Bill that pays farmers based on how much and how intensively they manage their operation to protect the environment, to protect the water, protect wildlife, um, uh, protect the soil, all those kinds of things. That's exactly what we should be doing with farm policy. But it's got a big target on it, and if we don't do something to, to rein in the cost of farm programs, that could easily be gone. Other things that have big targets are, on them are all the programs that invest in the future of rural America. Beginning farmer programs. Last Farm Bill, we uh, added to the traditional credit programs for beginning farmer programs a new beginning farmer and rancher authority that provides funding for training uh, young farmers on seeking out direct markets and alternative markets and uh, linking beginning and retiring farmers. That's going to be on the chopping block if we don't find another way to cut. Um, in recent years, we've made gains in research specifically focused on the research needs of organic farmers, sustainable agriculture. And as part of the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, there's even a program specifically designed to focus on the, the research needs of small farms. All of those are going to be on the chopping blocks if we don't find a decent way to make cuts. Rural development programs. Uh, the Center for Rural Affairs was instrumental in winning the only two funded rural development programs in the last two farm bills. One was the Value Added Producer Grants Program, which some of you may have experience with, uh, that provides grants to farmers and ranchers and groups of producers uh, to develop higher value markets. That'll get cut if we don't have a better way. Um, last Farm Bill, we won the Rural Micro Entrepreneur Assistance Program so that 
Um, it could fund the development of programs to support microenterprise development like we have in Nebraska, but fund it in other states. That won't survive if we don't find another way to make cuts. Um, and, and so there is a common sense alternative to that, though. We're, we've, I wrote a piece uh, last week in the Iowa Farmer Today uh, that laid out a proposal that we cap payments to the biggest farms and take away just one-third of the direct payments that are made um, every year, take away about one-third of those at times of high prices. Um, and instead of cutting programs that invest in our future, take five or, cents, five or ten cents of every dollar saved from those common sense reforms and commodity programs and beef up the, uh, what we spend on the programs to support small business developments, support beginning farmers and small farms. You know, we've cut spending on rural development by 30 percent over the last decade, even as our rural communities have been struggling. I think it's time to say that if we make some common sense reforms, we can save some money. And, and much of that will have to go to budget deficit reduction. But let's save at least five or ten cents on the dollar to help us create a better future out here in rural America. Those are all the kinds of things we can do to shape change in the future of rural America. The challenge is to get it done. And you know, there's always a lot of skepticism about our ability to shape public, about anyone's ability to shape public policy. You know, I, I'll be out speaking about these things and inevitably a farmer or someone will raise their hand and say, that's all great, I agree with you, but you know, there's nothing we can do about it. Well, that, my friends, is bunk. That is just flat wrong. There is something we can do about it if we step up and embrace our responsibilities as citizens in a democracy. The reality is that there are two sources of power in a democracy. One is people and one is money. But when people get cynical and when people give up and people withdraw from the process, money comes in to fill the void. But when people engage, they can make a difference. And on these issues, on these issues, the decisions are made in the agriculture committees of Congress, committees that are dominated by people from districts like yours. In fact, Kurt Trader's on the Ag Committee. My congressman's on the Ag Committee. And the only people who can make a difference, the only people who can hold them accountable is us, because there are congressmen, and we need to be about that. And you know, this skepticism about change in Washington is not a new thing. Um, it goes back over a century. I was reading, um, I was reading a story about Mark Twain some years ago, who, Mark Twain as a young man went off to Washington, I believe as a reporter, and being a writer, he wrote a lot of letters back about what he found in Washington, and Twain, wrote to one of his friends, he said, you know, when I got to Washington, one of the first things I found is that in Washington, you can find a good party just about any night of the week. And he said, you know, I started going to these parties. He said, they were something. There would be drinking and gambling. There was money changing hands under the table and crooked political deals. He said, there was even adultery. And he said, you know, it, it soon became clear to me that this was no place for a Presbyterian. <clears throat> And I did not long remain one. <clears throat> now, the, the moral of that story is that when we send people to Washington, if we don't do our job of reminding them where they came from and who they represent, they have a tendency to forget. We have to do our job. And so to address that, the Center for Rural Affairs is organizing what we call a National Rural Action Network that's made up of people who will write letters, make phone calls on critical rural issues before Congress, small farm issues before Congress. And we're not talking about just thousands of people. We're talking about 10,000s of people. And we're not talking about just the Midwest. We're talking about all 50 states. But I can't stress enough that, that we need everyone's voice on this. We need your voice. Because you know, we have the greatest political system in the world. We have a democracy. But democracies only work when citizens in that democracy step up and fulfill their responsibilities to hold their elected officials accountable. And that's what this is all about, so I hope you can join us. We have the opportunity to set a new course in agriculture, a new course in rural America, to change the course of history in rural America. But it's up to all of us to make it happen. And it's not easy work, but we can draw our example of how to do it and our inspiration to act from the pioneers, from our ancestors who built farms and communities across rural America. Earlier this year, I, I read a, 
an article by a gentleman by, by the name of Paul Hosford who lived in the small town of Albion on the edge of the Nebraska sand hills. And what he wrote was so eloquent, I just want to read a little bit of it. Hosford wrote, Pioneers were people just like us, good and bad, skilled and unskilled, successful and unsuccessful. But in looking back at those who succeeded, those who shaped the landscape we inhabit today, certain qualities become apparent. These qualities not only created su successful communities, but can also help revitalize them today. Not to romanticize, but the successful pioneers were courageous. They persevered. They made sacrifices in order to realize their dreams. The pioneers were builders, innovators, and entrepreneurs. They built farmsteads and dry goods stores, mills, roads, and bridges. The pioneers cared about community. They created organizations that brought people together to quilt and to husk, to sing and to pray. The pioneers weren't afraid of diversity. People from vastly different places with vastly different customs and languages worked together to settle the plains. The pioneers didn't just farm and raise livestock. They were at the same time carpenters, teachers, politicians, and planners. And the pioneers were visionaries. They could see in their hearts what the future could be, and they understood that through hard work and focus, they could achieve their visions. The pioneers were optimists. They didn't let the challenges of rural life dissuade them. Imagine if more people in rural areas could once again be as inspired by a vision of what the future holds, as reluctant to let the challenges stop them, as open to new ideas, as willing to do what has to be done, as our predecessors were. Well, that, my friends, is our challenge. Let's be the pioneers of this generation. Persevere, and let's work together to shape the future of rural America. Thank you.